SJC 12207, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, Inc. v. Department of Agricultural Resources. May it please the court. Wait, one second, oh. Mr. Milton. Restrain your enthusiasm for just one moment. All right, now release your enthusiasm. Thank you. Uh, may it please the court. My name is David Milton, and I represent the plaintiff appellant people for the ethical treatment of animals. PETA seeks reversal of the portions of judgment on appeal, or short of that, uh, an order vacating the judgment, clarifying the scope of exemption and the public safety exemption, and remanding to the superior court for discovery. The Superior Court made two fundamental errors. Can I ask you, what about the privacy uh, ex exemption? Uh, that is also on appeal, and uh, I, unless the court has questions about it, I, I rest on the briefs. Okay, you're oh. not ignoring it or waiting. Oh, not at all. Okay. Um, and the, I would just point out uh, that the uh, department's arguments about why that applies largely track their arguments uh, under the public safety exemption, which is that there is they really believe it's a threat to these individuals. So the, the court committed two fundamental errors. First, the court broadly read uh, a very narrow exemption. And second, the court held that the exemption requires the superior court to give deference uh, to the record keeper's decision to withhold records and that the, <clears throat> and that it requires the court to ignore whether, in fact, uh, disclosure of the records would be likely to jeopardize public safety. But if we accept your, what I think is going to be your first argument about, about reading the, the scope of the exemption incorrectly, we don't have to get to the second one, right? That's absolutely right, yes. So what do we do with the phrase, any other records relating to the security or safety of persons? or buildings? I think that uh, section or that you know, subset uh, of records covered by the statute uh, needs to be read under basic uh, principles of statutory construction in light of the enumerated items that begin the, the exemption. So any other records isn't any other records. It must be uh, records similar in nature, I believe is the phrase this court has used, similar in nature to uh, blueprints, plans, procedures, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, security measures, emergency uh, assessments, and so forth. Well, uh, beyond that, the, these uh, animal health certificates, uh, do, you, do you make the argument that, that these records have nothing to do with uh, um, security measures, they don't constitute security measures, uh, thus that um, you don't even have to go to the earlier language to make your point? I think, uh, I mean, it is a stretch. Uh, I mean, I'm not relying, uh, you know, large, I'm not placing, placing too much emphasis on that they are just categorically not even conceivably records related to safety. Uh, and security of persons, though I do think that is a bit of a stretch, but it is particularly, uh, it, it's much stronger, and I don't think that, uh, I think it's clear that they are not covered by the exemption when you read that second part in light of the, of the first enumerated so you, list. So you don't think the disjunctive or any other records, you don't think that means that we're going to other type of record? Uh, well, it doesn't say, or records pertaining to, uh, the safety and security of buildings, it says, or any other records uh, suggesting that these records are of the same nature as the initial list. So what is a public agency to do if it believes that the disclosure of records will pose a likely risk to the safety of the individuals who are going to be disclosed because of evidence that these people are being targeted by individuals involved in domestic terrorism? <clears throat> well, if it does not come within this exemption there, uh, I mean, this, we cannot rely on this exemption. The legislature, I mean, there may be other uh, avenues of, of relief, uh, but. Like what? 
I mean, it's a, it's a practical problem. I mean, I gather that there is a history of individuals involved in non-human primate research being targeted by individuals historically. It was sufficient to cause the federal government to be concerned about it. Uh, put aside, let's, let's, let's assume for the moment that there is that risk or that the individuals who were involved in making this decision reasonably believed that this would pose that risk. What are they supposed to do? Simply say, we have no choice but to release it because the legislature did not impose, did not include any provision that would protect them? Is that basically what you're asking us to do? Well, I, I don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what uh, the agency would have done before 2002 when this is passed, so presumably this, uh, when it was you know, wide open that any of these records could have been disclosed, uh, I mean, whatever you know, avenues they had then. But um, here, I mean, that uh, brings you know, uh, to the fore the second part of the statute, which is that in the reasonable judgment of the record custodian, uh, they must be likely to jeopardize public safety, and that... Uh, well, couldn't, at least under the supervisor's um, uh, guide, this is the one exemption, which was the one asserted by the, by the record holder, correct? Yes. This is the one exemption that permits the somebody, I guess the custodian or the supervisor, to ask the person seeking it what they want it for, right? Y yes, that's uh, that is the supervisor's position. And there's regulations just issued. I, I don't. I, I, don't I mean, this is to Chief Justice Gantz's point that one of the things that could be done in this kind of case, if this is the exemption that is um, advanced is to ask the seeker, what do you want it for? Uh, without taking a position on whether that is consistent with the statute, uh, that's not in the record. Peter was never asked, and so that's why it's- I'm not saying they were, but isn't that something that could be done if you, if you, if you, if somebody asserts this, if, if some record holder asserts exemption N, that is one available <coughs> avenue. Uh, that is correct. And that is, uh, there are some opinions of the supervisor of public records where they've, uh, an agency has asserted <clears throat> this is a public safety threat and the supervisor said, well, now you need to go uh, speak to the requester. Uh, for example, I, I, one of the examples uh, in the prison legal services brief, uh, the Department of Agricultural Resources, uh, in responding to a request for a list of all dairy farms uh, in the Commonwealth said no, uh, that is um, critical to the food supply in the Commonwealth. Uh, the requester appealed to the supervisor of public records uh, who remanded, if that's the word, back to uh, the department and said no, ask uh, the requester what uh, he wants to do with that. And then uh, it's my understanding that they worked that out. Okay, but I'm not sure you still, I mean, I'm not sure I've gotten your answer. I mean, is it, is, is, is it your view that even if there is a history of domestic terrorism targeted against a group, and even if the record keeper reasonably believes that this would put them at risk, that in your view they have no choice but to disclose? I'm not going to argue the hypothetical, but I mean that is definitely not in the record here. But that PETA is. I mean, that, well, I mean, like, let's let's first focus on the right. theoretical, yes. and then we can focus as to. I know your second point is a separate point, and you yes. would say that that they're not entitled to heightened deference. But let's imagine that even without heightened deference, somebody would say that is a reasonable fear. Uh, <clears throat> well, if that is the case, then I think uh, that underscores the importance of having de novo uh, judicial review. I mean, if, uh, you know, they can make an argument that this, uh, you know, applies to the statute, then, uh, you know, it the court uh, should be able to, uh, particularly in an instance where it's ambiguously, you know, arguably not even covered by the statute, the court needs to be able to um, review, review that, you know, with the presumption that the record is public and under the ordinary standards of review, which did not change with this, uh, the passage of this statute. 
and, and again, I, I, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I, there's not, excuse me, uh, I'm not sure that the public records law is the proper avenue to, to engage in, in this sort of law enforcement. I'm, I'm not sure what uh, agencies did, you know, for the... What do you think it means to say exercise reasonable judgment? Uh, I mean, clearly this is the only section of the open records law that gives this records custodian this kind of ability, right? Well, it, whatever, I mean, the question... I, it means I, something. It, it does mean something. I would caution before giving my uh, what I believe it, it does mean. I, I would caution the court against placing too much weight on the you know can canon of construction that every word must mean something. Given that what follows in the reasonable judgment of the record custodian is subject to review by the supervisor of public records, which is entirely superfluous and applies to every other exemption as well. So I think that waters down somewhat the idea that these boards must have, um, uh, you know, dramatic uh, meaning. But I think what they, uh, I mean, what I think they point to is there's the enumerated list, and then there's the, you know, any other record. So assuming you pass the threshold with the record, uh, then. It's not all of those records, but there's this further limitation that it must be deemed to be a uh, public safety threat. So uh, categorically, not every blueprint or <clears throat> you know, um, you know, structural design uh, layout is going to be covered. Um, there needs to be uh, a determination uh, in the first instance by the custodian that this is likely to jeopardize public safety. Well, what's the standard of review? If, uh, if the words are reasonable judgment and um, putting aside the, the procedure Judge Muse used in, in this particular case, what's the standard of review um, that, that should be exercised in determining whether reasonable judgment uh, was used? Uh, the standard of review, <clears throat> I don't, uh, if I understand the question is how should courts uh, you know, review this decision. I don't, the nothing in exemption N changed uh, what was then uh, you know, section 10 of chapter 66 and what's now uh, section 10A, which uh, in its current form says that it's a de novo standard of review and that there's a presumption of, the, of that the records are public and the burden is on the record uh, custodian to prove otherwise. And it would be a dramatic change to the to the uh, <clears throat> to the public records law to assume that the legislature, uh, you know, meant to um, alter the standard and take away that presumption. Uh, and I, I think before um, this court could find that, there would really need to be a clear statement of the legislature's intent. And there Do we just have legislative isn't. history on this. Uh, it was uh, the only history that I am. Uh, aware of uh, is the letter that then acting governor Swift wrote to the legislature when she filed it uh, and that is in the record I think it's an it's an appended to our reply uh, and <clears throat> and I, I'm the one reason where there may not be a lot of legislative history is this was an emergency uh, measure as part of a larger act uh, to protect uh, to provide certain protections against terrorism. Uh, and what uh, Governor, uh, Acting Governor Swift stated was that this was a very narrow exemption uh, for materials pertaining to public safety, including threat assessments, security plans, and certain records depicting critical infrastructure. And, and uh, under the, <clears throat> I mean, the court would only reach, uh, would, would look at that if it finds that the, the statute is irrelevant. I think it, uh, I mean, it's, the court would look at that if it found that the you know, four corners of the statute were ambiguous, and then I think that would provide strong support for uh, a narrow scope of the statute. So the, st the standard you would ask us to employ is not the heightened deference that Judge Muse thought was appropriate, but am I correct that you would say that the burden would be on the Commonwealth to prove that the exemption applies, which I guess would mean 
to prove that indeed reasonable judgment was used, that it was a reason that it was a reasonable judgment. Correct, and the reasonable, uh, you know, <clears throat> indicates that it's, it has to be objectively reasonable. The legislature could have just said in the judgment of the custodian, but they included a reasonable judgment, which suggests that there must be, you know, a basis um, uh, to reasonably conclude this. Uh, I see my time is up. Um, <clears throat> the okay, and, and, and you can finish your thought, but if uh, if, if you have I, not finished your thought, you may finish it. <laughs> And the only other thing I would say about the, the standard of review is that uh, there's nothing in the phrase reasonable judgment that suggests that the court should limit itself to the documents uh, that were allegedly relied on by the uh, custodian when it denied the request. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Spector, good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. <clears throat> Amy Spector, Assistant Attorney General for the Department of Agriculture. The public safety exemption provides a mechanism for the custodian to make a judgment that it's better to be safe than sorry, subject always to independent judicial review. We're, do you take that phrase to be completely independent of blueprints, policies, procedures, schematic drawings, et cetera, et cetera? Um, well, in our view, the first clause of the statute itself reflects a legislative determination that the particular records enumerated there, that is blueprints, structural drawings, schematics, et cetera, are, are themselves uh, documents that the disclosure of which would, would, could cause, could jeopardize. All blueprints? That well, can't be. It's the ones that would, that are likely to jeopardize public safety and cyber security, aren't they? Well, the structure, it could be read that way. I think that the structure of the statute more naturally is read to suggest that it's the second clause only that is subject to the phrase, uh, the disclosure of which in the reasonable judgment of the record custodian uh, is likely to jeopardize public safety. That, that, doesn't that seem um, like an, a huge, enormous leap when the acting governor says this is a very narrow exemption that we are adding here, and one that, I mean, it's just contrary to the whole idea of the, the presumption of records being open. Well, we're not, Your Honor, we're not, um, we're certainly not advocating a broad reading of the statute. We agree that exemptions should be read narrowly. Um, <coughs> we're asking the court today simply to adopt a common sense reading of the statute that um, in this case, the, the, the provision about blueprints is not really at issue. What's at issue is that we're asking the court to adopt a common sense reading of the statute that would enable the record custodian in its reasonable judgment to determine not to disclose information that could likely jeopardize public safety, even if the record in particular is not itself. Trump's White House at the moment. Um, well, Your Honor, I understand the concern, but th this statute has a very strong limiting principle to it, and I, I do take issue with the both PETA and the Amiki's characterization of the deference. Uh, we are not urging deference in the sense that they have used it. The, we, uh, we think that the statute has the, the use of the phrase reasonable judgment, which, as Justice Lang pointed out, does not appear in other provisions of the statute, that inherently uh, entails the exercise of some judgment. And the statute also has a predictive quality, that is the, the custodian has to determine whether the disclosure is likely to jeopardize public safety. Th that being said, though, the court has to determine, and we agree that the, the judicial review standard is one of de novo, independent, meaningful judicial review, wherein it determines whether that judgment was reasonable. But the judge here appears to apply the standard that is, as he says, a heightened level of deference is accorded well, he, you know, to the department. I guess the question is, what is your position? Is there, your position the same as what the judge articulated? Our position is not a heightened deference in so the sense So it's not the same as what the judge applied? Uh, well, I'm not sure what he meant when he used that phrase. Our position is that the only, d the deference that is entailed is only so far as to say that it's merely a recognition of the fact 
that, and that, that phrase doesn't appear in the statute, of course, the, the deference language, but it's mere, the, the statute itself reflects that the custodian has to exercise some judgment. We think this is because the legislature was concerned that better to be safe than sorry and not on our watch. So if the custodian exercises some reasonable judgment, um, that should be upheld only if, but only if the court independently believes that the judgment is reasonable. So, Okay, so you're saying that there's an independent de novo review. It is an independent de novo review, and we agree that the standard would be one of objective, object, objective reasonableness. Okay, and in determining what it is that is a reasonable judgment, don't you have to see somehow what it was that the alternatives were uh, that were considered by the agency? Or that, I mean, you take the position this was summary judgment-like, um, but that there really not, was nothing um, here other than the records that you think are uh, pertinent. Um, it's an odd summary judgment procedure that doesn't allow some discovery. Well, Your Honor, the reason that we opposed discovery here was that most of the discovery that was being sought by PETA was aimed at eliciting the reasons for the department's- Judgment, yes, for the reasonable, for the exercise of reasonable judgment. Well, no, it was, it was aimed at att attempting to get the department to more thoroughly articulate the basis for its decision. We had already essentially stipulated to that by submitting an affidavit to the Superior Court which identified the universe of things that the department had relied on, in primarily a federal Veterans Health Administration memo. We've conceded that it would be appropriate for a requester to be able to know the full universe of materials that the custodian considered, even if they didn't rely on some. So for example, something that undercut the custodian's ultimate determination. In this case, we have, we have in our brief indicated that there were no such other materials, but we concede that um, a custodian w discovery could be allowed for the very limited purpose of determining what what materials, what universe of things um, the custodian considered. Considered or ought to have considered. Well, considered and ought to have considered only in the only in the sense of we've said officially. You can't turn a blind eye if you're the custodian to information that would precisely. be pertinent. Precisely. Yes, precisely. We agree with that, Your Honor. So, for example, if if the department had received uh, notice that the Veterans Health Administration had rescinded its memo, the department could not turn a blind eye to that fact. Um, what, what about the requester's ability to challenge that which is set forth by the, uh, by the government? Well, they can and had a full opportunity to do that here in Superior Court by um, submitting materials that they thought showed that either the likelihood of danger was remote, it was either distant in time, uh, that some of the information was already publicly available and so forth. And uh, we agree that those are proper matters for the Superior Court to have considered. It, um, on balance, the court found that given the standard of reasonable judgment, the department had satisfied that, primarily based on a, a recent federal directive uh, directing federal agencies not to release the virtually the identical information. Um, but it certainly is entirely appropriate for the Superior Court to look at those kinds of materials to determine whether as, a, as an objective matter, uh, as an objective matter that the judgment was reasonable. Is your um, statement in the brief and an oral argument that, well, there are no records that would be inconsistent um, with um, the position that the department took. Um, is that statement uh, dispositive of the discovery issue or is there a remand that's required? Well, of course, we would prefer that the court not remand the case. Um, we don't think it's necessary here, but if the, if the court were to remand the case, that is in the nature of what the department uh, would provide. The, the plaintiff perhaps would have a a limited opportunity to test the veracity of that if if they chose to do so. We, do, we don't think it's necessary for the court to do so in the circumstances of this case. Um, but, but we acknowledge that 
the universe of materials that a custodian considered uh, is, is something proper to, to look into. So what do we do with a clause which spends nearly every word focusing on buildings and infrastructure, and you focus on the inclusion of one word, persons? Uh, how are we to cabin that and not let your, certainly, I mean, your better safe than sorry doctrine uh, manage to essentially undo this exemption and make it so broad that it covers almost everything? Um, well, Your Honor, the, the, I think the legislature, when it enacted this provision, which was an emergency provision, um, was understandably focused on the kinds of things that um, it was in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, we think that the overriding concern of the statute was to ensure public safety. Um, there, are, there are provisions in the statute where the legislature has specifically foreseen specific um, danger to particular persons. So, for example, abortion providers or persons providing family planning services. We think that this provision is simply, uh, we're not advocating a broad and the sky's the limit kind of um, interpretation. We are advocating that it provides another measure um, where, the, where the legislature was not able to foresee exactly the manner in which something like a domestic terrorism event might occur. Um, this, this provision allows a custodian to withhold documents that in its reasonable judgment might be likely to jeopardize public safety. Under the, the very narrow uh, construction that PETA urges, um, the government would have to give out the names and in, of, of veterinarians and the scientists who were working on animal research, even if the year before, uh, the kind of bomb that was set off at uh, two California labs had happened in uh, Massachusetts. We just don't think that that's a, a common sense reading of what, the, of what the legislature meant. So is the common sense reading that there should be some demonstrated uh, evidence of a history of them being targeted or of, event, or of actual domestic terrorism? That should be the basis. I mean, I worry here, if you're prepared to include farmers in this, uh, then there really is no cabining at all of the extent of this. Um, no, I don't think so, Your Honor. The 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 judgment in, in all in all respects has to be um, reasonable, and that's why there is a meaningful. I know, but I mean, but you say better safe than sorry. I mean, better safe than sorry invites an extraordinarily broad. Of course, you're always going to be safer to not disclose. So you're better safe than sorry only invokes my concern. It's about the most problematic statement I can imagine coming from the AG that you're going to apply a better safe than sorry standard because that can't be the standard. Well, I, I, I wasn't articulating that as the standard. I, I simply meant to say that that may have been what the legislature had in mind when it, it, it enacted this language I think to address the situation where it may not have been able to foresee with specificity um, the kind of danger that might arise as it has with, for example, the disclosure of the employment, the place of employment of a, a, an abortion provider. This, this language gives a custodian, um, and again, we're not advocating for a broad use of it, where it is improperly invoked, we think it should be reversed. Um, uh, by a court. Um, How could it be improperly invoked? Can you have an example? Well, we agree with, we think that the prisoner's legal services made a good point in their brief in pointing to three instances where sheriff's offices um, apparently relied on in, uh, this exemption to refuse to disclose videos that would have shown, or that did show excessive use of force of inmates. Uh, we agree that at least this exemption is not, was not, is not proper. We're certainly not advocating anything that would suggest the government using this exemption as a, as a curtain for government um, 
accountability. We understand and fully acknowledge the vital importance of the public records law. Um, when you talk about names and locations and addresses, a lot of uh, that type of information is, is already public. Um, now, now, some of it isn't, and sometimes that information being out there in the world can, can, can really uh, create a, a, a danger. But in those situations, and you just pointed out one of them, the legislature can pass a statute that precludes the dissemination of names and addresses and locations. So why isn't your example of um, people who might be working in an abortion clinic an argument uh, in support of uh, Peter's position as opposed to yours? Well, Your Honor, I think, I think it shows that where the legislature, we're, we're simply saying that where the legislature was able in advance to foresee a very specific type of harm, it, it enacted a measure specifically aimed at that. Um, we're not advocating an unlimited uh, expansion of this term. We're simply saying that we think that the legislature would not want to provide less protection for potential victims of domestic terrorism. Um, so but so is, is it relevant whether or not the research labs themselves have announced that they're involved in this research? Well, I think the extent of public, dis of public uh, disclosure of this information is something that a superior court could consider. Here, there was some information, but it, some of the information concerned places elsewhere in the United States. It doesn't remove the obligation of, of a custodian to exercise reasonable judgment, although certainly the extent of information and the remoteness or likely imminence of, of, the, of, of a public safety risk is, are matters that the superior court should properly may properly consider. So within the reasonable, should the determination of reasonableness include the extent to which this information has already been made public by those who ostensibly should fear their names or their identities being made public? I think it's something that the court could consider. Here, we don't know if um, th those disclosures happened before the federal directive, for example, so it's certainly something the court could consider but we don't think it's dispositive. The Commonwealth had an independent obligation to uh, assess the risk, and it determined, we think reasonably, uh, th that there was a risk here. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out pragmatically. I mean, if you have the names of three or four of these research institutions, would it be something you would expect before you would say it's too dangerous to disclose to Google those names and see to what extent the fact that they're involved in this research is, can be found by a Google search? Well, again, I don't think, I think the extent of public disclosure certainly at some point is, it, it, it is a relevant factor, but it doesn't remove the Commonwealth's obligation and to exercise its judgment to determine whether uh, it thinks that disclosure will, will create a risk or not. But it does affect whether or not that judgment was reasonable. Yes, it does. And if that's a relevant factor, was the procedure used by the Superior Court judge the appropriate procedure? Um, I think it was, Your Honor, because here PETA had every opportunity and, uh, and availed itself of that opportunity to present materials that did bear on um, the extent of disclosure. Um, again, we think I'm sorry, how can, how can, if PETA does not know the names of the institutions because you've, dis you've withheld them, how is PETA supposed to s show that they've already made their names and their, and their work public. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, 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 may have mis, I may have misunderstood your earlier question. They didn't. PETA submitted materials that showed that they're within the public realm on websites and, and so forth. There, there was some disclosure of some animal research in, institutes, institutions within the United States and some in Massachusetts. Um, they didn't. They could not pinpoint whether those were the same ones that were at issue here. Right. So isn't that the obligation of the custodian to, to do that himself or herself? Well, that, 
I mean, the specific identity could be something that uh, the Superior Court could have looked at, could have asked to look at the certificates in camera. It could have conducted that sort of review. Isn't that the work of the custodian to demonstrate that that was done before the determination was made as opposed to the Superior Court judge's job? Well, the, the custodian did not want to reveal the, the... Of course, but the custodian could say, I actually did a Google search of these names. We'll call them A, B, and C. And there was nothing from those Google searches which would disclose that they were involved in this research right. or that there was. But I mean, it does seem to me it's a little bit hard as an argument to make. We're not going to disclose that the university of whatever is involved in this research as part of their veterinary school uh, when, in fact, you go on that school's website and they say, we are involved in cutting edge research using non-human primates that's examining these particular problems. Right. Well, I mean, in this case, that certain, the custodian didn't do that. It's, it's the, the court, the Superior Court could have considered that. I, we would just urge this court that e even if this court does not uh, come out in favor of the department in this instance, we would urge the court to reject the narrow construction of the statute that PETA is urging and to adopt what we believe is a more common sense approach that would give meaning to the, the legislature's concerns about public safety. I have a question about the privacy exemptions we haven't discussed at all. I just wanted to, I was a little confused. The um, addresses there, were those the home addresses of people or were those the business addresses? Those were business addresses. So this is a privacy issue? Well, that's not really what that privacy exemption has been construed as, as being in the past. It typically has, I think, some of the cases that, that the courts in this Commonwealth have addressed have involved home addresses. Um, right. But and the, they're not always private either. It's just in certain circumstances they can be. Right. But the have court, you got one that says that business addresses are pri uh, fall under the privacy exemption? Um, well, I think, first of all, the under the federal act, um, the, one of the things that the the VHA memo cited was that under FOIA, under FOIA's uh, analogous privacy exemption, these, this kind of information, which did include employment locations, should not be disclosed. And that statute, of course, um, can be used uh, as, as providing support for the, the interpretation of our statute, which it's, it's similar to. Um, but in any event, the, the case law, including the Court, the appeals court decision in Giorgio makes clear that context is very important, mm -hmm. and the court has taken a fairly nuanced view to what information in one context may, may be deserving of protection, even if it's not in another. And so because of the public safety uh, issues here, we would ar argue, we argue that the privacy exemption does include even the, the place of employment addresses mm -hmm. here. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you.